Hello, and welcome to JNO Live. I'm Seth Kruger, Digital Media Editor at JAMA Network Open. Of course, if you're following along live, please send us your questions or comments on Twitter at JAMA Network Open or on Facebook Live or YouTube in the comment box near the video. Today, we are talking about the association of vitamin D status and other clinical characteristics with COVID-19 test results. We have first author, Dr. David Meltzer with us. Welcome, Dr. Meltzer. Thanks for having me. Sure, really glad you could join us. This is certainly an interesting and relevant uh, topic uh, for us during the pandemic. Tell us a bit uh, first just about who you are and why you did the study. Sure. So I'm chief of the section of hospital medicine at the University of Chicago. I'm also an economist and a health outcomes researcher. And I found myself uh, sitting at home working on preparing our hospitalist services for COVID and uh, happened to get an email about um, um, how viral respiratory tract infections might be decreased by vitamin D and got interested in this topic. Yeah, it's really interesting. I actually think I first heard about it on a Radio Lab podcast that someone sent me for a totally different uh, purpose, um, which I don't know. I know people love that show. I've never, I never really, I don't happen to listen to it, but it was interesting. Um, so tell us what you did and what you found. Yeah. So what I originally what happened was I saw this BMJ meta analysis looking at um, um, RCTs of um, vitamin D supplementation and vitamin D deficient persons and looking at effects on total um, respiratory tract infections or viral respiratory tract infections. And I realized that um, at the University of Chicago, we had a bunch of patients coming in the hospital who were getting tested for COVID and that some of them had been in our electronic health records before so that we might have vitamin D levels in them. So what we did is we pulled the approximately 500 people who um, during a couple of weeks in March and April were tested for COVID at the University of Chicago and had in their electronic health records a vitamin D um, level from the year prior. We also pulled treatment data so that we could combine the testing data with the treatment data. And then we compared the rate of testing positive for COVID of two groups. One that was we viewed as likely vitamin D deficient by virtue of having had a deficient vitamin D level and no documented increase in treatment. And another that we believed was not deficient based on having um, an adequate level and no evidence of a decrease in treatment. And then what we found was that the patients who were likely deficient were 77% more likely to test positive for COVID than patients who were likely not vitamin D deficient. Um, and we controlled for a variety of comorbidities that we could measure in claims, BMI, and so on. And those results were robust to that. It was really fascinating. Um, and, and I think from your introduction, you talk about how some of the most vulnerable groups for COVID have been some of the groups that are historically vitamin D deficient. Uh, people like Black Americans, Northern cities in the late winter, older nursing home, and of course, healthcare workers, because we get to spend so much time in the hospital. Yep, uh, yep. And, and in fact, that is exactly who comes to our hospital. So um, we were fortunate in the sense of learning to have that patient population. And I, I think that may have certainly made it easier to find this result in our initial sample, which was pretty small. And of course, you know, this isn't a journal club, but the, the big question here is, is this, an, is, you know, are there are there all sorts of other unmeasured confounders here? Who's getting measured? Are these vulnerable groups the same groups that are vulnerable for different reasons or the same reasons? Um, what's your takeaway? Are you taking vitamin D right now? <laughs> I am, as a matter of fact. Um, <laughs> and not just taking vitamin D, but trying to go outside and get some sun. So I guess that tells you what I believe, but you know, I'm, I'm a, a experienced enough researcher to understand that residual confounding remains and is a real possibility. It was notable that we didn't see movements in these effects when we did multivariate adjustment. So you know, that's encouraging. It's also quite interesting that now there's another study that finds very similar results out of Israel. So others are others are are seeing this, but nevertheless, it's possible there's some factor. I I can't tell you honestly what that factor is. Um, um, it's not obvious to me. Um, it is also striking that the tr the sort of estimated treatment effect that we're finding is um, very comparable to what was in that original meta analysis. Um, so it's a big effect. But could it be credible? Yes. Obviously, the only way to know ultimately is to do randomized trials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that brings up the big question, especially in the context of a pandemic right now with pretty severe consequences. And this would need to be, you know, some sort of like 
population level RCT essentially. How do you do that quickly in a way that gets this information? Yeah. So we're doing a couple of things. We actually have three sort of analyses underway. Um, one is more of an observational study where we're looking at some patients in a disease management program that I, I help run and we're trying to optimize their vitamin D and see what happens. That's not so much to sort of prove the treatment effect, but to understand what some of the issues are. The two large studies that we're in the process of doing are first a healthcare worker study, which um, we're in the final stages of NIH funding for. And that'll be done here at University of Chicago and at Rush. And the goal is to randomize 2,000 healthcare workers to either um, low dose um, vitamin D, so basically 400 international units, or medium or high dose, depending on their, their preference, and follow them over nine to 12 months. The other study is one that we're planning to um, do in the general public, focused on Chicago initially, but we'd be very open to expanding it elsewhere. 400 IUs versus 4,000 IUs, um, basically recruiting people on the internet and following their self-reported um, um, outcomes. Um, we're looking also at antibody testing, if we can do it through home testing and so on. Great. And Let's... that's also 2,000 people. But we would really like to expand it to 10, because as you know very well, it's, it's the number of events you observe. So right. you either follow them longer or you get more people. And one of the amazing things about vitamin D is it's just so cheap. <laughs> so if you don't get yourself into a lot of testing, you can do a study like this in really big scale really fast. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think, one of the things that's potentially promising here is that, uh, you know, a lot of times the, the kind of risk, risk reward balance is off so much in when you're, you know, in a hypothesis generating level like this. But vitamin D is a pretty safe and pretty cheap supplement. Um, of course, there's all sorts of issues. Supplements we talked about before, and a lot of supplements just don't have what they're supposed to have on the label yeah. in them. Um, yeah. uh, and there's also, you know, if if you know millions of people people started taking it, there is a chance for harm. Of course, we sure. don't know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, luckily, it, you know, for the big population-based studies, we're keeping our levels below 4,000, which the National Academy of Medicine has said is usually pretty safe for most people. We're trying to exclude those people who have medical complications that we think could raise risk. But I agree with you. It's mostly a pretty safe thing. Yeah. I mean, in, in my view, and I know where my, I guess, meta research biases are, um, and we talked about a paper on the show here a few months ago, is really the opportunity cost is if we spend a huge amount of money researching this and or, you know, distributing vitamin D capsules to every school or whatever it is, then that's and it turns out to not work then we just wasted all that time. And it's now, you know, something like one in four uh, clinical trials uh, gov studies are on are still on hydroxychloroquine. You know, we're just spending a huge time and huge amount of effort and a huge amount of the research apparatus. And honestly, just a lot of attention, um, just trying to yeah. unring that bell. Yeah, and I mean, with something like vitamin D that you use on a population level, there's another risk, which I would add, which would be the false belief that if you take vitamin D, you can go out and expose yourself and not think you're at risk. And that I, every time I've had the opportunity to talk about this, I've tried to repeat that again and again. This is not a substitute for wearing a mask or social distancing or any of those things. It's, it's a, a complement for it that we don't know whether it would work, but there are credible reasons to believe it might. Right. That's a, that's a really good point. And I think, you know, the way we all think about risk is really tricky. And, you know, I've heard, I, I can't tell you how many conversations like, oh, why do I need to do X? I'm already doing Y. It's, well, yeah. my car has brakes and an airbag. I still wear my seatbelt. We all. <laughs> right. It's okay. right. Right. Agreed. All right, great. Well, you've already covered your next steps really well. It sounds really interesting. Anything else you want to add about vitamin D or the paper? Um, the only thing I'll say is, you know, the dosing can actually be complicated. Um, you know, remember that it's a fat soluble vitamin and that when you start someone out on a, a dose, they don't reach steady state for several months. The other thing that I think is fascinating from our work in this disease management program is how many of the most vulnerable patients have significant comorbidities that affect how you think about vitamin D dosing. You know, from common things like um, um, being overweight or obese to somewhat less but still pretty prevalent things like um, 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 re renal dysfunction, um, you know, GI malabsorption issues, other sorts of things. So, I, I mean, vitamin D is this fascinating area where it's on the one hand a safe public health intervention, on the other hand, in some of the highest risk people, there are meaningful medical issues, you know, including hypercalcemia that you have to think through. Um, 
So there, there, there's a lot to process in it. The, the last thing I would just say is that, you know, particularly for medical professionals, I would urge them to go out there and read the literature about what a, quote, normal or adequate level of vitamin D is. Most of those recommendations are really based on bone health rather than immune health. And, and the truth is we really don't know what the right level is for immune health. And um, I think being very straightforward about that is incredibly important. And um, I, I think that some of the recommendations that are out there, just we really need to emphasize they were not developed for this context. So I think that's a really important message. I, I, I did not understand this myself until I started working in the area and reading about it. And I, I am more convinced than ever that more research is needed in this area, but we do have to make decisions now. So there's the challenge. Yeah, it's, it's, this is, uh, you know, unfortunately, the, the challenge of our era. Uh, so yeah, uh, yeah, really, really great discussion. Uh, There's a really interesting paper. Uh, hopefully, you know, really looking forward to seeing what happens with the trials here um, and what else comes from this. Because, uh, you know, if it's a simple, easy intervention, great. Uh, I have, you know, Lots of reasons to be skeptical because I'm generally skeptical. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. uh, I'll just say be skeptical and yeah. take a little vitamin D. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we got a dog recently, so I've been getting more sun recently, which has been that, good. That's good too. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Well, just thank you so much. During, walk them during the day. All right. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for joining. Um, of course, this paper and more are available online. Uh, at GemmaNetworkOpen.com, where things free and open access. We've got new papers coming out every weekday at 10 a.m. And of course, join us next week on September 15th at 3 p.m. for the next JNO Live. Take care and stay safe. Great, thank you.